I'm C. Alfinari. Welcome to Poison Ivy Acres. This is uh, my gardens. My husband and I have gardened on this property now. This is our 14th year and I just look forward to showing you around. But I do want to tell you why I call this property Poison Ivy Acres. Yes, we grow it well uh, and you know, poison ivy gets no respect. It's a native plant. It'll grow in sun or shade. Uh, it can be a vine. It can be a ground cover. Uh, great fall color. Berries for the birds. Everything to recommend it except that one little quality, which of course is why we dig it out when the birds plant it throughout my gardens. But I call this property Poison Ivy Acres for a different reason, not just because it happens to grow well here on Cape Cod, uh, but for me, it's important to remember that a garden isn't just the blue hydrangeas and the pretty zinnias and the lovely perennials and, and all of the plants that we want. A garden is those plants and weeds. It is the beautiful flowers and the unwanted and itchy. And as a gardener, if you can embrace all of that and not make it your enemy. This is, this is the perennial garden that I call the lakeside perennial garden because it's on the side of the lake. <laughs> we live on Lawrence Pond. Um, this is two and a half acres that slope in a long narrow piece down to the pond. So, And this garden is, like most of my gardens, flower gardens, a combination of annuals and perennials. Um, at this time of year, the end of June, uh, one, the um, red poppies, uh, Papaver somniferum, are starting to flower. They are annual poppies, and after they finish blooming, I let a few of them stay in the garden so that I have their seeds to scatter for next year, and the rest of them get pulled out. They are what I call my party crashers. I have a lot of party crashers on this property, and I'll be introducing you to several of them. A party crasher plant is a plant that you haven't invited to the garden party, but they show up anyway, and they come so colorfully dressed that you'll let a few of them stay. And the uh, Papaver somniferum, the red poppy or opium poppy, those are one of my party crashers. They come every year. They were seeds given to me by a friend in Nantucket and um, they are gorgeous, but they are not less work. Sometimes people think that self-seeding plants are less work because they plant themselves. It's just the opposite. They plant themselves. You have to be willing to, first of all, recognize what's a weed and what's a plant you want and save the ones you want. You have to be willing to edit out the excess, which there always will be. And you have to be willing to, once they are finished, since most of them don't flower all summer, you have to be willing to clear them out and have something else growing. So in this area, normally I put other annuals in here that are going to take over once the poppies are done. And I have some of that going this year with scovola in the front, but I decided that the back part of this garden, this year I was going to plant in edible plants and so I've got some um, silver sage in here and I've got then all of the stakes that you see with the uh, wine corks on them those are stakes that are holding up a pepper plant an edible pepper plant so this is going to be all peppers later on in the summer along with the flowering perennials and um, once the poppies get pulled up then you'll see the peppers and the sage and, and other plants well.
in my containers on the deck, I have several goals. One is to try new plants that some of the plant branders send me uh, in hopes that I'll write about them and talk about them. And I do if I like the plant. So I've got a lot of plants from various companies in here to try. So that's goal number one. Goal number two is to attract hummingbirds. And this is a hummingbird magnet here. This is uh, Kufia, commonly called cigar plant. This particular one is Vermillionaire from Proven Winners. And I include this in these containers every year because the hummingbirds love it. And the other plant the hummingbirds love in here are, is the Salvia Black and Blue, the blue uh, plant. That's the plant that proves that color is not important to hummingbirds. What's important to hummingbirds is the same thing that's important to realtors. Location, location, location. Hummingbirds come to a location where they've found a nectar source in the past. They don't care if it's blue or orange or red or white. Um, if it's a nectar source, they're going to work it. And if they don't see a nectar source there, they don't look around for something red or orange they go to the next known location. So these are known locations to the hummingbirds. In fact, they will be coming and hovering next to me as I'm planting these in late May because they're saying, step it up, step it up, get those in there. The other thing that I love about these containers, these are um, livestock troughs, and uh, I like them because they can either have a contemporary vibe or a rural vibe. My garden kind of has a rural vibe to it. Um, and the, um, they're big enough so that they can hold a, an exuberant abundance of plants. And I always grow King Tut papyrus in the middle of these. This is a plant that by midsummer and by the you know middle of July, it's going to be about five, six feet tall and it's going to have these fireworks uh, at the top of foliage and flowers and they catch the sun, the setting sun in the evening which kind of comes this way and they're backlit and so this area is the place where every evening my husband and I will sit. In fact, this deck was the inspiration for my book, The Cocktail Hour Garden, because there are certain elements like attracting hummingbirds and like plants that catch the evening light that I realized are important for a garden where you sit in the evening. This area we call the fragrance or bird garden. When we first moved into this house 14 years ago, my husband and I had a vision of putting a hot tub in this area. And so I designed the garden to be filled with a lot of fragrant shrubs and perennials, thinking that how nice would that be to be in the hot tub in the evening and have that fragrance. Well, after about two or three years, we admitted we'd never put a hot tub out here <laughs> for various reasons. And so it 
is still the fragrance garden. It is filled with fragrant plants, but it's also the area where we feed the birds. In the winter time, we put seed on this bench for the ground feeders. And in the summertime, we leave it to display the succulents. So it becomes a display area in the summer, and we just put the bird seed on the feeder for the summertime. Uh, let me point out a couple of plants if you love fragrance. First of all, you need this plant, which is the common name is summer sweet. It's clethra. This one is hummingbird, which is a little bit shorter than the um, regular native clethra. And it is fragrant in July into August. The pink flowering shrub behind the clethra and the white rose is lollipop azalea, highly fragrant plant. A deciduous azalea that blooms in June. And over here, it's not in flower yet, but this is lemon drop azalea, which blooms in July with yellow flowers that are stop in your tracks, fragrant. Uh, more people should grow lemon drop, particularly around a deck or a patio. Um, so everything in here uh, in the background are shrubs or perennials that have a, a pleasant perfume to them. And then in the front, I plant a series of annuals. It varies every year. Um, usually it includes pine, golden delicious pineapple sage, which you see that it's under the, the cage right now so that while it's growing, the squirrels and the chipmunks don't trample it. Because since this is the area we feed the birds, of course we have squirrels and chipmunks too and little red squirrels. And if I don't protect those plants, that's kind of a thoroughfare for them. So I let them get bigger before I take the, the little cage protection off so that they don't get trampled. <laughs> So this is the grape arbor. Um, my husband built this. In fact, he built the sheds, the arbors, um, and the fence in the vegetable garden. Uh, everything but the stone walls, all the outside structures my husband built. It's not his business. He's a scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic, but um, he likes to build things. So, so that's good. And uh, we both had a vision of a big grape arbor because he is Italian. He has many 
relatives in Italy. And when you go to Italy, there's always the grape arbor outside that you can sit and have a nice big lunch and with family. And so we wanted to have that too. So he built the arbor and we planted one, two, three, four kind of fancier varieties of grapes initially. And they poked along for three years and didn't do too much and the birds got the grapes and, you know, and we really were growing the grapevine for shade, not for the grapes. So my husband, after the third year, said, this is ridiculous. He went to the edge of the woods. He dug up a wild grapevine. That's this one. <laughs> planted it here. Within two years, we had shade over the whole arbor. <laughs> and not only that, we have big um, Concord style purple grapes every year that make the most incredible grape sorbet. So this has done great duty for us. We still have the three fancy varieties. We never even know whether they make grapes or not because the wild guy has taken over. This is the place where a lot of my house plants go to summer camp. So they come outside and they're at summer camp all summer. They love it in here. And um, they, we, I also have a few, as you can see, hydrangeas in pots. I like growing some hydrangeas in containers. Not only do they bloom a little bit earlier because they've been overwintered in the garage, but I do it to show people in other parts of the country who have trouble growing these plants that they can have them in pots and you just have to throw them in the garage like lawn furniture in the fall and then bring them out in the um, you know early summertime and you can have hydrangeas so for people who are in winter climates where it gets too cold to grow these plants they can do it in pots and that's why I have these going here this is a slightly smaller uh, livestock trough and in here I grow edible flowers from seed. Uh, all the plants in here have flowers that are edible. These of course are a variety of bean and the flowers and the beans are edible. I've got nasturtiums growing in here that haven't quite started to bloom yet. There's calendula, there is coriander, and this is one of my favorites, this is borage. And it's going to have bright blue flowers uh, that are kind of have a cucumber flavor. Bachelor buttons, many people don't realize the blue bachelor button flowers, the annuals are edible. So all of these, the seeds were planted toward the end of May and I'm already harvesting nasturtium leaves for um, salads and yeah, I'll show you a couple of things you can do. Nasturtiums are one of my must-have plants, both in the vegetable garden and, and here. And that's because not only are these leaves great in salad, but you can put a little hummus or goat cheese in here and fold them over or roll them up, and it's the perfect hors d'oeuvre. So they really are wonderful, kind of a spicy taste. And the leaves and the flowers are great in sushi or great in fish tacos. So um, plant nasturtiums, easy to grow from seed, full sun, uh, one of my must grow plants. I'm from New York City and when I started gardening I didn't know what a dandelion was really and and it's been fun I bought the house in 98 after being in Provincetown for three years or so and the backyard was really um, it was overgrown on the street side and very overgrown like 10 feet in on each side, and then there was just a, a big empty lawn, just a lawn. One of the landscapers I learned from, when we were at a big yard, she was like, just do one room at a time. So I always see the garden as a series of rooms. You know, the veggie room, the fruit tree room. Um, 
helps you from not being overwhelmed. Right. You're just working, you're just tidying up one room, <laughs> and you don't have to think about the other 12 rooms. Our garden has just taught us so much because this year we've observed five different bird nests See, and we've seen everything do it. We've seen <laughs> birds do it, we've seen bees do it. So no, we've seen the most amazing there's things. There's sex everywhere. There's in sex this yard. everywhere in this yard <laughs> and it's, there's life and there's death and there's mm -hmm. drama and it's, it's just our favorite place. This is a primarily perennial garden, although, as I mentioned earlier, I always plug in annuals in addition. I, I, I would not be without annuals in my garden. Uh, many people think that a perennial garden is less work. It's just the opposite. A perennial garden is the most high maintenance garden you can plant because of the weeding and the dividing and the editing and the weeding and the weeding <laughs> and the weeding. So, um, you know, it's, it's work for a uh, perennial garden. But I love also annuals because they are the ones that bloom all summer long. You plant an annual at the end of May, and as long as it's the right annual, it is in flower into October. So I've got a few of those in here. Um, when we bought this property, it was kind of a blank slate. There were three hydrangeas, a summer phlox, uh, a lily of the valley, which I ripped out immediately because I hate that plant, <laughs> and lawn. And this was all lawn. And um, so this became the entry garden. It started out primarily with shades of blue, yellow, coral, and white, because I love that combination. In the meantime, a few pinks have made their way in and a few purples, and so, you know, things change. But um, but primarily blues and yellow and white here. And I, I wanted to point out these urns. These urns were planted with spring flowers in March, all right? The dianthus and the violas and um, a colored heuchera. And like many spring plantings, they looked fantastic at the end of May, which is the time that you would put your summer annuals in. So I wasn't ready to take them out yet. Now they're fading as we get toward July and I will take these out. But in the meantime I needed to have the summer plants that are going in here going. And so that's what's in these fabric smart pots right here. Um, this, These are the plants that will be planted into this urn um, now uh, once I will pull these out and I will, because the smart pot is bendable and malleable, I will just stick that whole thing right into the urn and it has given the summer annuals a month of growth, which they have, you know, taken off as they do. And then they'll be instantly full and gorgeous in the beginning of July when I put them in the urns. Uh, I'll show you some other smart pots that we use up in the vegetable garden. It's a wonderful product and uh, we use them in many ways throughout our landscape. So right now, one of the plants that you see in here uh, are the yellow verbascums. That's another one of my party crashers. And um, I have never met a verbascum that I don't love. Most people are familiar with the common mullen. Um, this is not that, but that is also a verbascum. And the bees adore verbascum, so that's one reason that I let a lot of these stay. Once they finish flowering, I will cut them to the ground because A, they're not that attractive, and B, if I let them go to seed, it's gonna be a forest a verbascum in here next year. So again, you know, the, the self-seeding plants take a little editing and a little work, but they're worth it. 
I knew that when we moved into this property, I wanted a place where I could play with a different combination of annuals every year. It's like having a new box of crayons, right? It's a chance to play with color. And so in the front of this area alongside the wall, these are all annuals that in later in July and August, September, October, it's going to be a riot of color. Red and yellow and blue and orange and pink, zinnias and cosmos and um, what else? Gomfrina, fireworks gomfrina. Uh, all of these I've grown from seed. So sometimes I buy six pack annuals and put them in. This year I grew them all from seed. I'll do a little different combination every year. There's some sunflowers popped in here. So I've got pops of sunflowers and pops of nasturtiums and they will just be so colorful later in the summer. And then on this side of Annual Alley, you see more party crashing um, poppies, more poppies than humans should be allowed to have. Also nasturtiums and tomatoes. On the rebar teepees are tomatoes. So the tomatoes will take off later on in the summer and we'll have uh, kind of all the vining nasturtiums at the base of the tomatoes through the summer. And then this is the entrance to our vegetable garden. This is the main vegetable garden and it's about I think 40 by 40 um, and we have four different quadrants with paths in the middle and right over here you see the garlic and the garlic is now ready to harvest you can see the um, tops are starting to get yellow and die back and in fact I I dug one out earlier today um, so that I could show you um, this is how it looks when it first comes out of the ground. And what we will do is uh, at the end of June or early July here on the Cape, that's when you harvest garlic. And we put in the garden fork and loosen the soil. And once they're loose, then we pull them out like this. They get bunched together in bunches of about a dozen and tied. And then those bunches get hung in the shed to cure for about oh two weeks or so. Um, the first year that we were here on this property we hung them in the garage and the entire house smelled like a pizzeria. So we decided that they would get hung in the shed and they get hung in the shed that's over there where we have the lawnmower stored as well. Um, and a lot of the garlic gets put in the refrigerator for use as fresh but a good I would say 
three quarters of it will get um, the bottom cut off, roasted in the oven uh, till it's that nice soft roasted garlic. We squeeze it out of the paper and then onto wax paper, freeze that roasted garlic and then put them in plastic bags. And all winter long, anytime we need garlic, we just take that roasted garlic out of the freezer. So that's what's happening in the garlic. And once this area gets pulled, we will use this land to plant crops that we will be eating into the winter. Mustard greens, pak choy, kale, carrots, radishes, beets, uh, all of those are crops that here on the Cape you can plant in the summer and then be pulling through October. Our kale we harvest into December and even New Year's. Very frequently we will have kale on our New Year's Day meal that is comes from this garden. So long season for many crops here on the Cape and you can use that garlic area as a place to um, grow many of those winter vegetables. And then we've got, you know, all the other vegetables elsewhere in the garden. Um, uh, this garden desperately needs weeding. We, we've been away for a week, so we have to come in here with a hoe. Uh, we manage weeds in the vegetable garden primarily with a hoe and with mulches. So you'll see over in this area, there are two mulches there. There is the excelsior, which is, um, comes from Hyannis Country Garden where I work. They get pots that are packed in excelsior, which is shredded wood. And rather than put that shredded excelsior into the dumpster, uh, we take it and we use it as mulch. It's quite effective as a mulch. So we've got excelsior there. We've got chopped up leaves and pine needles around the tomatoes. Um, and that makes an excellent mulch in a vegetable garden and no Oak leaves and pine needles do not make soil acidic. Old myth, let's all kill it right now. So um, that's what's going on in here. Over here is what I call the bunny bin. And the bunny bin is not to keep the rabbits in, the bunny bin is to keep rabbits out. Because my rabbits particularly love green beans, kale, and broccoli. And that's what we've got going in here, plus some cucumbers that will go up the fence once the peas are done. And so those are going in the bunny bin and it keeps Thumper out of here. And um, the other things like the garlic and, and the tomatoes and the squash, the rabbits don't bother. So, so these are more smart pots, um, the fabric pots, and we grow uh, several vegetables in them. We grow all of our potatoes in smart pots. And this year I've got eggplants and some small varieties of squash that I haven't grown before. So I'm kind of trialing those in smart pots and cucumbers here on the edge of the garden. So with a smart pot, you can grow food anywhere. You can put these on top of asphalt. You can put them on a shell driveway. You, you know, as long as you've got sun, you can put them on a, a, a saucer on top of a deck. You know, you don't want the smart pot itself right on the deck because it's wet and fabric and it'll, you know, tend to rot your deck. But you could put it in a ceramic saucer uh, or a plastic saucer and have it on a deck and grow food in them. Um, they come in all different sizes. They come in several colors. Uh, there are even ones that are instant raised beds. You can unfold it, you know, fill it with soil and plant a vegetable garden. So it's a wonderful product and made in the USA. I, I, I'm not being paid to endorse them, but I am particularly enthusiastic and we use them a lot here for adding vegetables in spaces that otherwise maybe we wouldn't be growing vegetables. South Bed, we start in the spring with iris reticulatas, tulips, crocuses, 
grape hyacinths, and then as the garden progresses, the poppies, the peonies, um, what else comes up on them? Poppies are the, one of the big yeah. things, and then the foxglove starting to, yeah. to come out, and of course they don't really care where they seed, so every other year it's a different spot, they like to get in the walkway, and we leave them as accidental. And then we have our Allium Goliaths here that grow taller than a human. <laughs> and then in back here is all our Orientals, our Asiatic, and our Orient Pet Lilies that will come out in a couple of weeks. And these are some of our favorites too. It's the Mallow, it's the um, Northern Hibiscus that dies back to the, it dies back to the gr uh, ground every winter, so it comes back from the roots. The Rose Campion. Like. Rose Campion. My grandma used to love these. We even have some uh, hybrid um, milkweeds. This side of the bed here is the dahlias. And there's 130 dahlias along the fence, which will grow up over the hedge and cascade down by the fall. Around here, we put in some. Sunflowers and other things to help support them. The hedge is a perfect support for, for the winds that come off the ocean because we get a lot of wind here. So without the hedge, we'd never be able to grow anything on this slope of the sand dune that we're on. This is the southeast corner of the garden. And for some odd reason, tomatoes do very well here. And um, I'm slowly building up a a light defense for the LED lights that's in the street here, so these will be growing taller eventually. Um, lots of fun's had at this patio. Yeah. Planters. Yeah, uh, we have all these. sorts of planters and interesting flowers. Nasturtium from seed. Yeah. So I've, I've learned that you can actually have a pansy retreat by putting the pansies in the shade. So we have some over here in the shade. And I've just planted caladiums. So this is completely shaded most of the day. So they'll actually do well over there. These are a lot of Japanese lantern plants that suddenly have taken off. They like it over here. And then the foxglove is self-seeded over here, which was like never here. Around the cottage, we have butterfly bushes of purple and pink and lavender that the monarchs love in September. I mean, it's just like, sometimes we come out here and there's like eight or nine of them. Um, the lace cap hydrangea is gonna be a highlight. Yeah. Just, just starting to, to come out. This is the best year um, since we've been here, we moved this from our old house. Uh, this this rose here actually was a, a hybrid tea rose, but um, the graft died over winter, and now we just have the wild type coming out. I did treat it for black spot, and it'll be, it'll look much better. But it it's always got little blooms through it, and we have several of these wild type red roses from buying grafts and having them not make it. And this is a trained um, trumpet, trumpet vine. You can see here how big the cane is on that. And this here just cascades down onto the grass. Likes to crawl up the house too, but the cottage, but it's another story. We tried to get the wisteria to... Yeah, the wisteria I think needs a little more light, but we're gonna let it grow. And this is a lateral branch that decided to take off. And everybody keeps asking, where did you get that weeping blue spruce? And I'm like, it's not a weeper. <laughs> it just happens to look like one. And um, the nice thing about it is the elm tree is playing uh, height control there by whacking off the top. So this is as big as it's getting. It'll bush out a little bit more because I didn't really want it to get too tall. And Mother Nature solved that problem for me. This is a trumpet vine. Uh, the cane on the base of it is about the diameter of my wrist, 
and it's been here for many, many years, and it just cascades orange blossoms all throughout summer. We're just starting to see the blossoms forming on them, and they come out in clusters. Um, clematis. And just for kicks, and we have hops. <laughs> no danger. Yeah, danger, danger I'm gardening. gardening. <laughs> This is our, my seed starting shed. Half of it is insulated, solar heated, and this is where I start uh, most of my seeds in the winter time. But outside the seed starting shed, this is a thornless blackberry. This is a Doyle's thornless blackberry. And if you have a small arbor or um, a small archway that you want to plant something on, Consider a thornless blackberry instead of a rose. Number one, they do flower, they're quite pretty. Number two, you can see the canes get quite large. These canes will get about 12 to 15 feet long. This will be dripping in blackberries in August. And the interesting thing is, oh, you can see a lot of them starting right now. The interesting thing is, that uh, the birds don't bother these. The birds will eat our blueberries, they'll eat our raspberries, but they leave the blackberries alone. So uh, the Doyle's thornless is a great variety. The main thing that you need to know about this plant is that every year in the fall, you cut down all the canes that bore fruit the past year. All of these that are now blooming and will have berries, they will get cut to the ground. And these that are just starting, as the summer goes on, we will be tying them up. And these will be the canes that have berries next year. So it does take some managing, uh, but big crop of blackberries, highly ornamental uh, and a fun plant. And you can see the bees love it as well. This is my seed starting shed and my husband built this. It, this part faces south and a lot of light insulated. So starting about in February, it never goes below freezing in here. So I can start my seeds in March in here. There's no electricity, there's no running water. Um, you know, we have watering cans for keeping them going. These are the very last of the plants that uh, have yet to put in the ground. I'm always still putting things in the ground just about up till July. Um, these, I grew cotton this year, so that's gonna be fun. This is a cotton plant and I uh, can hardly wait. The, it's an ornamental plant, the flowers are pretty, and then you have those cotton balls, a lot of fun. So um, one, one thing I wanted to point out to you, and this happened by accident for us, is that when my husband was building this, I said to him, I need a place to store my pots. And it would be great to have this back wall be shelves where the pots can get stored. So he built these shelves and you can see I make good use of them for the containers. Um, but we found that it was something very interesting that in the winter time, the sun comes through these windows, it heats up these pots, and then overnight the pots of course release their heat into the room. And so they're a heat sink really. It was completely uh, unintentional, but it works really well to have those, those clay pots be heated during the day and then they release their heat in here overnight.
this is an area that I call hydrangea circle because it's primarily a circle of hydrangeas with a, a big magnolia tree uh, in the middle. Uh, I plant different hydrangeas in here mainly to see how they will perform. If they are not good performers, I say, thanks for coming, bye, and they go bye-bye. This is gonna be a good hydrangea year, so there are many plants in here that were destined to leave, that I was gonna say goodbye to, that are actually going to flower well this year, but they are not particularly bud hardy, so a couple of them are going to go. But many of them are really good varieties of hydrangeas that I particularly love. This is one of the hydrangeas I was going to say goodbye to this year <laughs> because it's not reliably bud hardy. This is Glowing Embers, um, also called Alpenglugen. And um, Glowing Embers has rich purple flowers, which is why I planted it in the first place. But it's not particularly bud hardy. So it only, for me, blooms maybe once every seven years. Now it could be that with our climate change and winters getting warmer, could be this would be a good plant for the Cape from now on. So I'm giving it another chance. Uh, it's going to be gorgeous this summer and we'll see, you know, coming up what it does. Uh, these are three plants that are really reliable here on the Cape. Uh, this one is Penny Mac. Uh, this one is Twist and Shout. And over there we have Endless Summer. Endless Summer is kind of the gold standard blue hydrangea on the Cape right now. Um, this uh, Twist and Shout is in that Endless Summer line. It's a lace cap and Penny Mac. Both Endless Summer and Penny Mac are very similar. They are re-blooming. And by re-blooming hydrangeas, um, some people think that they are somehow different in that they flower all summer. All hydrangeas flower all summer. If you don't cut them down and you have them in afternoon shade so they don't get burned, they're gonna be in flower all summer long. These have the distinction of putting out a few new flowers in the fall. That's like late September, October. So if you cut even these down, you will have very few flowers. Never cut your hydrangeas back. Never try and make them shorter. Give it up. If they're too tall, move them because um, they will replace their growth in one summer and you will have, instead of blue flowers on top, if you've clipped your hydrangea down at any point of the year, you will have a dome of green foliage and only a few blue flowers around the outside. This hydrangea here is a native Annabelle just coming into flower. The flowers will be white and large. And this is our native smooth hydrangea or a hybrid uh, named cultivar, I should say, not a hybrid. It's a named cultivar of our native smooth hydrangea. I've got other ones over there by the Enchantress that are Grandiflora, not Annabelle. Incredible is another popular variety of this plant. These are great in bouquets um, and really nice in both uh, shade gardens and part sun gardens.